I would like to welcome to the stage Leslie Cordero um, from the New York Times, who's giving a talk for us on effective observability in microservice architectures. Enjoy. Oh, yeah. Cool. Uh, I see a few people coming in. I'll wait just a second. All right. I'll hop in. So, hello everyone. Welcome to my talk on effective observability patterns in microservice architectures. So, just a little bit of background on me. Uh, prior to beginning at the New York Times, I spent all of my career in uh, EdTech. So, I've seen EdTech change and grow many times, but I think I can speak for everyone uh, when I say that no one ever expected uh, that we'd have. No one ever expected that we'd have to deal with the challenges that we saw when it came uh, to remote, uh, to schools coming remote online. Um, challenges I thought I'd never see in my career happen during remote learning times, going from over, going from 40 million to over 100 million users on Google Classroom, onboarding entire uh, uh, entire school districts or entire countries and onto Google Workspace and Classroom, and all the production issues that had to be uh, supported. To, had to be solved to support all of that. No one was fully prepared. And so, as you might imagine, this gave me an even deeper appreciation for the perils of debugging production. And so, I took this experience with me when I moved on to my next role in ed tech uh, and focused a lot of my time on observability as a tech lead and engineer. So, this talk is a compilation of the learnings from this time, as well as my other past and current experiences building data pipelines and developer platforms. Now, I like to start my talks off by providing a shared definition of the topic I'll be presenting on, so we'll begin there. So as much as I hate repeating words on a slide, uh, I'm going to do it, if only for emphasis. So borrowing Liz Fang Jones' definition of observability, observability is the ability to understand what's happening inside of your software systems, to debug problems you've never seen before, just using telemetry emitted by your applications. More importantly, she says, it's now, also not about just a specific tool, it's about a team's ability to analyze that telemetry data. So this is a loaded definition, um, but there are some components here that are important hi to highlight. The first part is about being able to understand the internals of your software systems just using telemetry, which is just data that represents the inputs and outputs of your software. You most commonly know these to be things like traces and logs and metrics. And the reason for this is because the hardest and most interesting problems in software are the ones that you've never seen before, right? It's incredibly hard to predict what specific issues you'll encounter during development phase, though. So the better alternative is to just equip engineers with the right data, the right tools, and most importantly, knowledge. Which is why the last part, this last part is what really distinguishes observability. The most important part of observability and doing it well is that your engineers understand how to use telemetry to figure out how and why their application is behaving the way it is. And this can be hard enough for any application, but it becomes even harder as our applications grow in complexity, right? Complexity has made things so much harder. Um, it's made applications harder, made building applications harder, and it's definitely made debugging applications harder. And it's made development so much harder, right, that we as a collective industry have evolved the ways that we build applications. So much like the way we've evolved the way that we build applications to embrace microservice architectures, we must evolve the way that we debug applications to embrace this full definition of observability. So if microservices are a solution to reducing development complexity for large applications, robust observability is a solution to reducing the complexity of debugging these same large applications. And so microservices and observability, they can both be great solutions to navigating complexity. However, there are three new organizational challenges uh, inspired by Susan Fowler's microservice standardization talk that pose a risk to organizations that rush into implementing microservices or observability. And so first we begin with the ever, com ever first common uh, challenge of silos and drift between different teams or organizations despite operating in the same architecture. So one of the organizational benefits of microservice architectures is the new autonomy that we gain, um, that we gain from uh, microservices, right? We love the flexibility of being able to use whatever tools um, and build the services in the way that we think is best, but the downsides of that is that we lose consistency that makes knowledge transferable between teams. And this lack of shared knowledge um, is what leads to serious silos, and the lack of consistency is what causes this drift. And we see the same thing happen with observability, right? With the increasing number of tools out there, um, different instrumentation techniques, 
uh, ways of structuring logs or collecting metrics, we end up in a similar situation where context is very specific to the service or team that you're working on. Now, the consequence of these silos is that teams end up doing a lot of duplicate work, right? Because we end up reinventing the wheel for, how we, for what we consider our best practices or best patterns. And this, uh, this leads us to the very core problem of decentralization, right? Um, by introducing a large degree of flexibility, we lose this advantage of ensuring that teams have a minimum bar of quality for how they're approaching work. So next, we have a challenge that engineers are obsessed with talking about, which is the risk of, have, which is the risk of having multiple points of failure. Right? Many of us have experienced the uh, consequences of one microservices failure becoming a point of failure for other services. And we generally understand this risk, and we know that we have to plan for this risk. And the, true, and the same becomes true for observability, though in a slightly different form, which is in the form of information gaps. So when we have a telemetry gap in our system, we risk not having all the needed context for identifying all the contributing factors of an issue in another system. And that context might be essential for figuring out our next steps forward, right? And as we have more and more of these information gaps in our telemetry, this risk only increases. So if we're unable to determine the next steps forward because of these information gaps, the failures that we see in production can continue, longer for, uh, can continue on longer than they would have had we not had those gaps to begin with. So much like we need to think critically about how we plan for failure, we need to think critically about, obser about observability and gaps and how those might lead to prolonging these failures. And really what's at the core of these previous two challenges is that there's an inherent lack of certainty. The autonomy that comes with decentralization and distribution uh, means that coordination and collaboration efforts between teams is less necessary. And the danger with this trade-off, right, are the assumptions that we end up making along the way about how other teams approach observability and telemetry collection. And so when these approaches inevitably end up conflicting, we risk teams no longer being able to trust each other to provide the context that we need when we're investigating issues. And this isn't an exciting state to be in, right? There are both technical and cultural consequences in allowing this sort of thing to fester. So that leaves us with the question of how do we address these challenges while being able to preserve the organizational benefits that come with microservices, like autonomy and clear boundaries of ownership. And so the answer here is by building a standardized observability platform. So this concept of platform thinking or, pla or platformization has become popular within microservices for the same reasons that we're talking about it now, which is that it helps drive standardization to address the challenges we just reviewed. And so, what does a platform actually encompass in this context? And so, I define a platform as having three major components. The patterns that guide us, the strategies that support us, and the stack or tools that we use. So at this highest level, we have patterns we use to make our systems observable um, and understandable, right? In the context of a standardized observability platform, these patterns should serve this primary purpose by defining how we use standardization to address new organizational challenges, again, while maintaining those original organizational benefits of microservices. And so the way that standardization does that in an observability platform is ultimately by standardizing the way that we communicate, communicate, both in terms of how our services communicate with one another, but also how we enable our services to communicate with us. And so going forward, I'll refer to this pattern as generally having a standard communication protocol. All right, so let's get more specific as to what these communication protocols encompass and how it addresses silos, drifts, silos, drift, points of failure, and uncertainty. So there are three requirements or patterns that make up a standard communication protocol. First, we have the need for standard data specifications. So these specifications should clarify the expectation of what our telemetry should look like, right, to reduce any uncertainty that leads to silos and drifts. And getting these data specs is foundational because this is a telemetry we'll rely on to investigate and solve issues. And when this data isn't consistent, right, there lacks a level of predictability and reusable knowledge that makes, every, that makes analyzing the telemetry easier. So essentially what ends up happening is that we spend unnecessary time building context that we could have already had had we built with consistency. And so to make this a little bit more concrete, right, let's talk through an example where three different services um, have logs um, that are in the same application, but their spec is inconsistent. 
And so pretty immediately, right, immediately, we can see that there are some differences here. In the first two logs, um, we have two JSON formats with the same trace ID, right, but it wouldn't be easy to identify them as such because uh, the key formats don't match, right? One is camel case, one is snake case. I'm sure we've all seen some version of this somewhere. And in the last case, right, the camel case trace ID matches the first log, but now it's not even in the same format, right? We'd have to go through the trouble of parsing this random string before even being able to match it to other traces. And so that sort of data transformation, right, that should never happen in, during an active investigation, right? That's friction that we should proactively solve by making correct and consistent formats, a table stakes pattern for observability platforms. And so next we have standard context sharing. So this context sharing is governed by a set of rules for how context should be sent or propagated between services. And this is important because shared context is what allows us to directly connect or correlate tel uh, related telemetry together. So for example, right, having a way to re easily retrieve all the logs that we just saw through a trace ID. The information that makes up this context should be defined in our shared data specs, so really what, provides, um, so really what this provides us is a mechanism that services can use to comply with our standard. And so again, to ground this into reality a little bit, right, let's build off of our last log example. Oops, sorry. Cool, and then there's a switch. Two of my, I'm sorry, two of my slides got switched. Um, so again, we have two different services, but this time, right, we formalized the way that we pass the trace ID by taking advantage of a protocol that we all love and are familiar with, HTTP. And because all of our services use HTTP, right, we can standardize the, standardize the way that we pass context by always inserting the information into its headers. And now we can go to the other slide. So lastly, we have well-defined interfaces. And these interfaces should serve three primary use cases. The first is collecting the telemetry data from a software component, for example, tools that actually implement how we collect logs that we saw in our previous slides. Two, processing that telemetry data, right? These might be separate interfaces for things like reformatting, deserialization, and then exporting it to other interfaces. And then lastly, actually analyzing that data. And these are more of our end user facing applications, so tools that we use to investigate, such as like Datadog or Honeycomb. And these interfaces should be well defined because they clarify the expectations of how our systems are being observed. Now, I do have more to say here, but I'm going to leave it here for now because we'll revisit this later on when we talk about how these patterns manifest in our observability stack later. Now, before we go into how these patterns manifest in um, the tools that we use to observe our system, let's revisit our definition of observability. So earlier I said what really distinguishes observability, right, is this highlighted part about how it's not really about your telemetry tools, it's about your team's ability to analyze that telemetry. And so far, we've mostly talked about the patterns that drive standardization Right? And in an easy, perfect world, right, we would set these standards, build tools to support these standards, use these tools, and just become like, really awesome at debugging production problems. Right? But just like every solution in software engineering, right, it introduces its own unique sets of trade-offs. And in the case of introducing standardization to the ways that we observe our systems, now we have to start thinking about how we make sure that teams actually follow these standards. Right? And more importantly, how do we make sure that the teams have the skills to even use our platforms effectively? So to address these challenges, I, deform, I define platform support as a second component of our platform. Right? Because a platform without adoption or engineers without the skills to use that platform is an opportunity wasted to mature our, our organizational engineering practices. Cool, so before we head into defining the strategies that guide platform support, right? first we have to acknowledge that building observable applications requires investment. right? investment in time, investment in resources, and investment in people. Telemetry isn't something that's just given to us for free, right? We have to think about observability as we're developing our applications instead of just afterwards, which is a pattern I've seen far more common than it should be. Now, having been on many product teams before, I understand the difficulty in, in prioritizing this work, right? It can be really easy to devalue this when you're t deciding between, you know, investing in making logging better versus like a new shiny feature that you know your users will love. And it's mostly we're in the middle of an incident that we start to regret having not invested this time. 
And this tension is why a lot of microservice organizations have come to embrace the idea of having separate platform teams. And this organizational pattern aligns pretty well with what we've talked about so far, too. It does make the effort to standardize easier if you have a team dedicated to doing this work more full time, instead of having to coordinate efforts across multiple teams or more multiple organizations. Now, platform engineering teams, however, right, aren't completely uh, saved from the social challenges of this work, right? Instead of having to worry about effective coordination strategies, we have to worry about effective supportive, uh, about, we have to worry about effective support and adoption strategies. And so what do these strategies look like? First, I think the most effective strategy for enabling engineers to observe systems is to make that, is to make observable systems, uh, building observable systems easy, right? Setting the standards we were earlier is a huge step towards that goal, but we can also reuse patterns from developing production-ready microservices to further serve this goal. A common microservice pattern is to introduce the way, uh, is to standardize the way that we uh, build services so that it's easier to build um, production-ready services, right? So you see this most commonly through org-wide templates or libraries, and we can apply this pattern here as well. And we can also take advantage of uh, our set standards to actually implement the interfaces supporting those patterns in a way that makes them reusable and easy to integrate with throughout your org. And the benefit of this is that as platform teams take on the implementation details that product teams would have to take on otherwise, the more we can make sure that teams are following standards while freeing up time that can be spent, time, uh, that can be spent tackling problems that can't be automated or implemented away. And so one of those harder problems that can't be uh, automated or implemented away goes back to Liz's point about building up our team's collective ability to, uh, to analyze El Telma tree. And again, this is the most important part of observability. And this is why the time we save by consolidating efforts to build tools that support us, is, um, that support us in analyzing telemetry is so crucial. Because the biggest investment that organizations need to make with respect to observability is providing engineers time to invest in their skill sets. And so defining what the support for this looks like is very can be very challenging, but the best thing I've ever done to support the teams I led was to standardize the way that we do on-call um, and what actual on-call looks like. So I know a lot of us can hear like on-board, on-call uh, on -call onboarding and training and kind of cringe, but um, and that's because it is hard to do well. But if you begin to see it just less, less as just onboarding and more as an essential feature of how you do engineering, the more uh, value you'll be able to get out of it. And just to elaborate here a little bit, right, one of the advantages of standardization is that knowledge does become easier to share widely, right, since we purposely build with the intention of shutting down silos. And lastly, the most effective long-term support strategy is working to embed observability into your culture. Fundamentally, this means consistently reinforcing the idea that observability is a crucial part of what it means to manage production services. And so the strategies we talked through lay some foundation for making observability a part of your engineering culture, but there are plenty of other ways that we can do this to, we can do to reinforce this, right? Cultural change tends to happen in two ways, um, and often both together, uh, top-down and bottom-up change. And when executed together, right, these two approaches can be an effective force for driving prioritization. And so for those of us who are engineering leaders, whether that's a manager or a tech lead or a staff engineer, um, we can take on the work of driving up this kind of, this type of change. So for me, right, this has meant working a lot with my engineering peers and my cross-functional partners like product to get their buy-in on um, that this work deserves prioritization. So for product folks, right, tie this work back to your users, right, since that's ultimately what unifies us. Um, users want reliable application experiences. And so as engineering leaders, right, it's our job to translate how this technical investment translates into the user and business impact. So luckily for us, the industry has already thought about how to do this effectively, which is why I spent a lot of time in my last role driving adoption of SLOs, or service level objectives. And so I'm not going to go into the details of all this work because of what it looked like, because it could be its own separate talk. But the important takeaway here is that SLOs provide a clear decision framework that makes it easier to hold your culture accountable to your reliability needs. Cool. So now that we've reviewed the platform and support strategies or patterns guiding our observability platform, we can start to talk about how these actually manifest in the way that we build the actual tools um, that uh, I'll call make up our observability stack. <laughs> 
So what even is an observability stack, right? What is its purpose? And so an observability stack is basically a collection of interfaces or tools that facilitate service to service, service to service, and architecture to engineer telemetry communication. So if you remember the interface pattern from earlier, right, it introduced the idea that separate concerns should be handled by separate interfaces, right, usually through the form of APIs, SDKs, et cetera. And so I briefly mentioned the use cases then, but just to reiterate just to radiate them and put them into a larger context, let's review them again. Cool. So again, the goal here right, is to, facil is to fil facilitate communication between our architecture, seen on the left here, and ourselves, the engineers, which is basically the receiver portion on the right. Our architecture right, uses standardized communication protocols to generate telemetry. Uh, our tools, the end user facing ones I mentioned, like Datadog or Sumo Logic, um, receive all that telemetry so that we have access to it as needed. But so how do we go from generating our telemetry right to actually receiving it? And the answer is that we need some layer or layers of abstraction to facilitate this. And so I'll, roughly, I'll refer to this roughly as the communication layer of our observability stack. And so there are many different design decisions you can make here in terms of how you separate the interfaces. Um, but I'm going to use my data eng background here and split into three phases that roughly correspond to an ETL data pipeline. <clears throat> and for folks who are unfamiliar with that acronym, right, ETL stands for Extract, Transform, Load, um, but we'll use Collect, Process, and Export instead. So again, the first, in, uh, the first interface here instruments telemetry from the different parts of our architecture. Um, the second part, right, is that once that telemetry is actually instrumented, right, we have more interfaces that process this data to standardize it. And then lastly, we have the interfaces that export telemetry to uh, our end user facing applications like Honeycomb or Datadog. And so now that we've re reviewed these different parts of our communication layer, we'll uh, shift our focus back to talking about the patterns that, and how they should apply throughout this different pipeline. So the, most important, the two most important design principles that should guide our stack um, is first that our communication layer needs to be reliable, right? In addition to the actual data pipeline being reliable, reliability here also means that the telemetry itself is reliable. And this means in addition to minimizing data loss and duplicate data, we want to make sure that the data we have is accurate or complete, right? And completeness should be defined or informed by the standards that we uh, talked about earlier. The next design principle we have is um, data richness, which expands how we think about telemetry to include an added flexibility that allows us to collect data that's specific to the service and environment that it's being admitted in. I talked a little bit around this earlier, but part of defining our specs for our telemetry is also defining how a service um, can emit service-specific data. And the reason for this is because it's how we solve, it's ultimately how we solve unknown unknowns. It's not always clear what data may or may not be relevant during an investigation, so we generally try to bias towards collecting information that can't be found elsewhere or reasonably proxied. That means embracing high-dimensional or high-cardinality data instead of being scared of its complexity. So what do these uh, design principles actually look like in practice? I'll review four best practices that you can use to build a robust communication layer. The first goes back to our first pattern that we started off, which essentially asked, what's our shared definition of telemetry? I posed this question and why asking and answering this question is important, but I didn't really provide an answer outside of a general reference to the fact that traces, logs, and metrics exist. And so what I'm about to say isn't anything new to the industry, but it is important, which is that whatever shared definitions your organization converges on should be driven by an event-oriented model of telemetry, where an event is one singular unit of work. And this is because being driven by events rather than being driven by traces or logs or metrics removes the limitations that we often put on ourselves by caring about one of these more than the others. In an event-oriented world, right, the best insights we get from analyzing telemetry data are the insights we get from piecing together these different ways of interpre interpreting telemetry, right? In other words, it becomes less about a singular log or metric and more about here's a thing or an event that happened and um, how can I use my trace data, my logging data, and my metrics to figure out what, why, and how this event even came to be? And this is, a this is a flexibility we often don't afford ourselves when thinking about observability, 
we tend to see traces and metrics and logs as completely different things when ultimately they're just different representations of the same information. Cool. So now that we have these beautiful definitions of telemetry oriented by events um, that we can follow that we can follow on um, through our pipeline, right? Uh, we also have to still care about reliability and rich data um, a lot here, right? So what's our next step forward? Well, that's instrumentation, and again, we see the influence from our standardization pattern earlier. The biggest benefit of standardization is the certainty that it provides us. And when we talk about our data needing to be reliable, what we really mean to say is that we need to be certain of what it will look like. We need to be able to query our data with met expectations of what we will get back. And since instrumentation is ultimately what generates our telemetry, it's important that the way, that the way we instrument our telemetry is consistent. That way we have a baseline understanding of how we can expect all of our events to look like. Which brings us to our next two best practices which is that auto-instrumentation should be your first strategy for instrumenting your application since it's the best way to ensure consistency. Now, I included manual instrumentation here as a fourth point because you will ultimately need manual instrumentation to annotate context that, specific, context that is specific to your architecture or systems. But generally speaking, right, that type of instrumentation should be complementary to auto-instrumentation instead of a replacement. And so that wraps up the best practices for our communication layer. What we're left with now, right, are those tools that end up receiving all that data um, so that we, the engineers, can analyze it. And so when it comes to this part of our observability stack, right, most of us rely on external vendors for these tools. For example, um, in the past, I've used Datadog, Sumo Logic, um, New Relic, et cetera. Most of us aren't building homegrown observability tools on our own, right? So instead of focusing on design patterns um, like I did in the past sections, we'll actually focus on a few criteria patterns for, that can inform how we uh, choose the, um, the tools that we need. So when it comes to choosing tools, both generally, but of course I'll be focusing on observability tools, um, I think of it a lot as an exercise of managing complexity again, right? We already know, we already know that we have to learn so many tools as engineers um, and we should always be skeptical and purposeful about adopting a new one. And so what does this purposefulness look like? And so first and perhaps most obvious, right, is thinking about what observability gap would it actually solve? Is it giving you new information about your systems? Is it actually enabling you to do something that you currently can't? We want to have access to functionality, right, that will enable us to debug, but we also want to be careful about introducing redundancy, both in terms of functionality, but also in terms of introducing multiple data sources to reference. Right? And the consequences of this kind of redundancy right, are that having multiple data um, sources uh, can ultimately lead to having conflicting information. Right? And having multiple ways of doing the same thing also leads to diverging practices. And so this is the point of view that I think we should always be starting with when doing any tool evaluation. Secondly, right, how compatible is it with your existing platform vision? Right? How compatible would it be with your core architecture and your uh, observability stack? Right? Um, does the way that these tools uh, collect data work well for your architecture pattern? Are they event-driven, um, whether you're in a service-oriented or event-driven uh, mar microservice architecture? So, and other things to ask ourselves, right, is like, would it require us to take on more complexity by supporting new interfaces, or can we reuse existing collection, processing, or exporting tools? And then next, right, how easy is it to use, right? Developer experience is always important, but it's especially important when it comes to the tools that you use to debug in production. Right? Bad tools are annoying enough, period, right? but there's nothing more annoying than a bad tool when you're in the middle of an incident and stressed as hell because you can't figure out what's going on because you're too busy fighting your tools. And so ease of use right, can mean uh, many different things, but some of the things I look for are how easy is it to set up and adopt? Would it require a huge migration effort? Right? How seamless would that migration effort be? Um, also, how easy is it to find or query the data that you need? Um, all of these questions are the types of things that you want to be asking uh, before embracing a new technology. And then lastly, um, I said this earlier and I'll say it again, uh, platforms or tools without adoption or engineers without the skills to use those platforms, right, is an opportunity wasted to mature our organizational engineering practices. And the level of support that your organization might need um, can be very situational, right? In the past, the idea of event, oriented telemetry wasn't, was one that was pretty new for the engineers I was working with. And so it would have been very unreasonable for me to just expect them to suddenly shift their way of thinking towards this framework. And um, you know, despite the fact that I think I did a pretty decent job of evangelizing the ideas, right, it's not something that I had to do on my own. 
And so before treading into this rabbit hole alone, right, consider what support around the tool is actually uh, available. Right? And uh, this doesn't just refer to the specific types of support that like, might be provided by your vendor, right? but also like, how is the developer community around it? How often are they updating standards and practices? Um, which transitions me to my last and final point slash anecdote. Right? It's a very exciting time for the observability space. Right? There are a lot of brilliant minds and communities thinking about this stuff deeply. Um, open telemetry is one that's very near and dear to my heart. And there's still so much to learn, right? And so I think one piece of advice I'd like to leave you off with is don't try to learn this on your own. Learn and, and, learn and contribute to the communities already doing this work. Because as much as the strength of your observability is about your team's ability to analyze telemetry data, the strength of your observability is about the industry's collective ability to learn together and make progress together. Thank you. <laughs>